Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans number 62. I'm Fred Green. This episode features two different conversations, and both guests were not only winners on the PGA Tour, they also both had tremendous success on the Champions Tour. These interviews were conducted in October 2008, just before the Charles Schwab Cup Championship at Sonoma Golf Course. I was invited to media day for the event, which was a typical media event of a bunch of guys in a room asking guy players, hey, how are you going to do today? What do you think of the course? I, meh, I don't really care about those questions. But afterwards, I got to spend a few minutes with two very special pros. Lauren Roberts won the Charles Schwab Cup the previous year and the following year, along with 13 wins on the Champions Tour, eight on the PGA Tour, and as fate would have it, he just celebrated his 65th birthday the week we're publishing this episode. At the time this episode was first published, though, back in 2008, we had just launched a channel on this new platform called YouTube. Have you heard of it? <laughs> anyway, Golf Smarter TV, which is still available today, features hundreds of videos that I've created covering instruction, travel, tech, and Golf Smarter and Golf Smarter Mulligans podcasts. Please click on the subscribe button to get regular updates there. Again, that's youtube.com slash golfsmartertv. I'll make sure to put the video that we created with Lauren on today's blog post, which you'll find at golfsmarter.com. Now, Lauren will be at the tail end of this episode, but up first, I was lucky to spend time with Jim Thorpe, who is now 71. Jim won the Schwab Cup Championship the previous two years, in 2006 and 2007, and was part of the inaugural class of the National Black Golf Hall of Fame back in 1986. The National Black Golf Hall of Fame, celebrating golf's black history, is located in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Jim. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you, guys. Listen, uh, you grew up in a big family, mm -hmm. but you grew up on a golf course. Yeah, my dad was a greenskeeper at the Roxborough Country Club, just outside of Raleigh, North Carolina, for 55 years. So my brothers and sisters, seven girls and five boys, we grew up on the eighth hole of the golf course, and uh, it was a lot of fun, man. Uh, so you must look at a golf course differently than most golfers. I mean, there's a lot of players who come out that are the children of players mm -hmm. uh, and children of coaches. That's right. But as the son of a greenskeeper, of a superintendent, you must see a golf course much differently than everybody else. Yes, I do. I'm one of those guys that walk down the fairway. I pull up a weed that's sticked up in the fairway or something, or uh, uh, a little crabgrass or something. I pull that up out of the ground. That's, that's stuff we did growing up as kids from dad's orders. Or you replace a divot. And golf courses, I think, are magnificent. I don't care if it's sand trap, water, tree line. I think all golf courses, when they build their golf courses, they come in and put the hard work and effort in there. Then it's up to us to keep the beauty of the golf course there. And that's kind of the way I look at a golf course. That's that's one of the things I love about the Sonoma Golf and Country Club here in, in Sonoma. The, the, the golf course is so well manicured, man. So it just kind of frees you up to go out there and enjoy the breeze and the trees and listen to the birds sing and, and just go out there and have a wonderful round of golf. One of my all-time favorite lines is from a movie called Garden State, and Alan King's looking out at a golf course, and he said, Ah, uh, golf, nature on a leash. That's exactly what it is, nature on a leash. It's just absolutely beautiful what they can do to a golf course. What they can do, you know, it's amazing. You can walk in uh, in Connecticut at Fox Swiss Resort Casino. There's a golf course. We built two golf courses called Lake of Isles. It was an old boy's camp about, I don't know, 14, 1,500 acres of land. And, and uh, Reese Jones Jr. come in there, and they look at this piece of land. They says, okay, we can do two golf courses here. Then they start their routing process. Then they start knocking a tree down here, cutting a tree down there, putting a road in here, putting a sand trap in there, routing the fairways and all that sort of stuff, utilizing the lakes, and uh, you see the wildlife flying in. And it, it's just, I, I, I tell you what, it, 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 it is nature unleashed. And it, it, it's absolutely magnificent, man. You know, so as the son of a superintendent, strategically, mm -hmm. how do you see a golf course differently than most other players? I think I look at a golf course uh, uh, different because of the fact that I grew up on a golf course. I've seen what went into the making of a golf course. I, I know what it takes to, to, to build a sand trap. I know what it takes to build a green. 
you know, uh, it's like when you're out there, you're playing with a, with a person that misses a putt and he takes his putt and bangs it into the green or something of that nature. And I'm saying to myself in my mind, if he only knew what went into the building of that green, the making of that green, you dig it down about two feet, you put your gravel, you put your pipelines for your drainage, then you put your stone and you come back with your sand, and then you come back with this six or eight inches of dirt, and then you put your seed down. It, it costs a lot of money. And when you damage a green or something like that, which nature would make it recover, but it takes time. And so when when I look at a golf course, I look at the imagination that went into the golf course. You know, what would this guy thinking when he says, I'm going to make this adult leg, 440 yards of the adult leg right. I'm going to bring the lake into play. I'm going to slope the fairway toward the lake so we get the drainage when the when the, when the rain comes. It would, it would drain off into the lake and that sort of stuff. So, you know, I remember years years ago when we had to create lakes on a golf course. Uh, when there was man built lakes and I watched my dad and the crew go out there and start the lake with brim or bass or fish or something of that nature. And then you see the little khaki weeds come up around the lake and they would bloom and give it that, give it that, uh, uh, nature look like this was here when we got here. And so I see all, I see all of, all of those things. I know what conditions, what are dry spell can do to a golf course what it can do when you overwater a, a, a golf course uh, i know leaving one golf course going to another golf courses you can you can on your, the bottom of your shoes or on your golf club you can transfer some type of weed or some type of grass and i don't forget when i lived in buffalo new york i used to play a golf course called Craigburn. And Craig Byrne, to me, had the most beautiful luxury fairways you've ever seen. And I would take up these massive divots with my wedges while I was playing golf out there. And we filled the divots with sand. But I would put the divots on my golf cart, take them home and scratch out a place in the yard and put that divot down. And after about eight, nine years, my yard started looking like a fairway. And people said, man, what you do to the yard? And I was too ashamed to tell them I broke the divots in from the golf course. But, uh, you know, when you look at a golf course, you do, you see nature unleashed. And, and also you see the beauty. You see the hard work and the labor, everything that goes into it. Uh, people, a lot of people don't understand why a person would pay $100,000 to join a golf course. But when you find a golf course, uh, just a magnificent golf course, the layout, the scenery, and a beautiful clubhouse. You can sit out back and smoke a cigar, have a little shot of wine or brandy or something of that nature. And you just sit there and wonder, you know, what was they thinking when they said, I'm going to build a golf course here? What was they thinking when they said, we're going to route this golf course down through nature and we're going to leave this area here for the birds and the wildlife and, you know, we can't test this area over here, but we can do this. It just, it, it just, it's mind bothering. And then late in the year, uh, uh, especially during the fall of the year, when you have courses in the in the northeast where the trees start to bloom and change colors and, you know, the autumn days, the leaves are blowing and kind of flutter into the ground and you see a deer walk across, you know what I mean, and you see a raccoon or something of that nature. It, it just it, it, it takes you to a place that you like to just live there. And, you know, so, it, it, I mean, it's a magnificent thing, you know. Whoever come with the created the idea of, uh, of the game of golf, that I'm going to build these golf courses, and you take the greatest architects of the world, the Jack Nicholas's and the Graham Marshes and the Pete Dye, the Robert Trent Jones, and so many great architects there that that have that vision and, 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 and that can go out and, and cut a pass down through the trees and, or, or fly over in the helicopter and take pictures and take it back to the office and say, okay, we can run it this way, cut back this way, the car pass and go that way. we got to use the water there, leave the slope in there. I mean, to me, that is magnificent. That, that takes a lot of creativity, man. And to have grown up to be a part of this, yeah, my dad spent 55 years. Uh, the good thing about it, you know, I, I look at them now, you know, they have the ride moors where we push moors. Uh, I mean, you, you have the tractors and the golf carts and all that. So there was no such thing. I mean, when we started back in the days getting golf carts back in the mid-50s and that sort of stuff, man, we was really making progress. And i I never forget, as a, as a very, very young man, out by the, let's just call it the utility shed where we kept all the moors and the tractors and that sort of stuff, off on the side by a light pole there, I built a little green about as big as four or five golf carts parked together. 
I bet you know, kind of stole some seeds out of this shed and that sort of stuff, and and went over and and and, and, and you get the rich black dirt, and you try to do the same thing they did when they build a build a, 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 a build a green from scratch. And about two years later, I had one of the best greens in the whole state, man. And uh, and but 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 you know, my my dad would say, okay, it's time to vertical cut that little green, or it's time to spike that little green and and put a a cover, a, a put a coating of sand on that green. And, and those are things that that you learn. Even today at my home in Florida. Where I live, my daughters always come out and say, Dad, why do you work in the yard so hard? Well, I grew up doing that sort of stuff, you know what I mean? So I, I like to see the beauty of the grass, how it so evenly grows and that sort of stuff. And every now and then you see a patch of crab grass. I don't know where it blows in from, maybe from a bird dropping or something of that nature. And you go out there and you and you cut around and you dig it out by the roots and stuff. And, and crab grass will grow, grow anywhere. And then you go back a week later and you notice how nature has covered that spot. And you know what? That's to me. That's the beauty. That 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 is the real beauty beauty of it. You know what I mean? And from a plan standpoint, a golfing standpoint, we weren't allowed to play on the golf course every day, even though we lived on it. And my dad was a greenskeeper, but we understood that because Pop would explain it to us. But when it came our our caddy days, our days we could play and that sort of stuff. Then later on, things changed and and open up. Uh, it, 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 it became more beautiful. It felt like we was a part of a creation that my dad had helped create it. And, uh, it, I mean, it's been a love for me. And, uh, to me, it's the greatest game in the world. And if you notice in golf, I don't care what p- sports you play, professional baseball, football, run track, whatever the number may be, basketball, when your career is over, the first thing you do is go find a set of golf clubs. You want to go out there and attack nature. And, you know, I'm looking up here on the left and on the ninth hole here, what the guy's doing. They got a coat in the sand on the green, and you got about eight, ten guys working there. And I remember seeing my dad do that sort of stuff by himself. You know, he would drive the, the track over, and we load it with a coat in the sand, and we would go hit golf balls and that sort of stuff. He'd go out there and shove it himself and throw it around, and, and we, we had what you call a drag. You drag it across the green, and it would thin the sand out, and it would sink into the, the, the turf and stuff. And it, it, it was absolutely fantastic, man, and I, I think that's one of the reasons that, that uh, golf would be a, 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 a part of my life until the day I die. You understand that most golfers don't get to play on hundred thousand dollar a year courses, and nope. they they play on weekends at best, maybe two, three times That's if they right. really get a lot of time to play. If here you are, the son of a superintendent who ended up being a professional golfer, but you have an opportunity to give advice to the the common man, the common player out there about greenskeeping, about the love of a golf course. What kind of advice would you give them about? The, from the son of a superintendent. From the son of a superintendent, I would say to the golfers out there and those people that play golf who love the game as much as I love it, treat the golf course like it's, like it's your little baby. You know what I mean? Make sure she's got plenty of water. Make sure you don't drive your golf carts in the wrong place. And don't make it when it, a big rain come. Make sure you don't drive the golf carts in low spot. Don't beat up the greens. Prepare ball marks. Nothing, nothing, nothing can... Uh, uh, imagine uh, uh, if, if, if if you can imagine what the beauty of a golf course is. You know, when you, when you when you sit there and you look across the the sloping and the rolling hills, and all the grass is cut to the same level, and you you see a patch of birds fly over, and they're they're singing, they're happy, uh, the the sand traps are shaped and they're well manicured. Uh, you know the you know the you know the tees. You know what I mean. You, 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 I mean you don't hit a bad tee shot and stick your driver down in the tee because because the tee hasn't done nothing to to create that. It's, it's all about the swing you put on the golf shop. If you can visualize these things, if you really love nature and, and love what man has created and what nature has blessed us with, then you wouldn't go out there and do things to de- to destroy that. I remember years and years ago. That my dad's little golf course there, Roxburgh Country Club. Uh, we're getting ready for the member guests. The golf course was in such great condition, and somebody just out of the blue, probably some kid or somebody had too much to drink, drove his car across the golf course, spinning the tires all around, 
across the green, through the sand trap, and you come up the next door, this beautiful golf course that you worked on for months, getting it ready for the member guests, and something like this happened. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a real smack in the face. Like somebody just kind of pulled the plug out of your ad machine, and you go, God, what happened? You know what I mean? But uh, if you know what, if, if 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 you love the game, just 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 take care of it. You know, you replace your divots and put a little sand on that divot where nature would take over and let it grow back. Uh, you know, don't go out there and do nothing stupid to the green, such as banging them around or, or, or kicking with your feet and that sort of stuff. And just go out there and, and enjoy what man has has created and what nature has blessed us with. And I tell you what, it will improve your golf game also. Golf is so unique, especially professional golf, compared to every other sport, because here you are, you're going to be 60 soon. Happy birthday in February. Thank you. Um, and you're competing professionally. Isn't that great, man? Isn't that amazing? And it's, it's amazing because, you know. Because the, you played football in college. Played football in college. You played PGA Tour. PGA Tour. And here you are at, at the best part of your game. Yeah. And, and you're. I mean, there's no other opportunity to be able to compete at 60 years old and success like this. No, you know what? Life for me started at age 50. I'm telling you, I mean, I had a good run out there. It was great, a wonderful wife and family. But life would have started at age six. I was able, at age 50, I was able to give them the things that I never thought I would be able to give them. And probably the, the most enjoyment, people ask you, why do you play golf for a living or what caused you to play golf for a living? It, to me, it was a way of supporting your family and making a good living. But to travel from North Carolina to California, from California to Arizona, from Arizona to Hawaii, and, and you see these magnificent golf courses that has been laid out that, uh, you know, man add a little water to, add a little seed to, a little fertilizer to, then he manicures it, and nature takes over from that. I mean, can you imagine... I mean, just you stop and think about it. I, I was just, you really are the son of a superintendent, aren't you? Everything comes back to the golf and the green. I, I, I love it. I, I, honestly, I love it. You know, something that you close your eyes that you see. I never forget, you know, you know, at home, the first thing I do in the morning, I jump up in the morning. We live probably 150 hours off our golf course. I jump up in the morning, put my shorts on, my tennis shoes. I, I don't jog anymore. I just walk across the golf course. And, you know, you look at the dew on the golf course, the most beautiful flowers, the trees are blooming. It, it, it's just a sight to behold. And if you love the game, if you love nature, then you can never do anything to destroy a golf course. At the age of 60, i got to believe that you're feeling more uh, aches and pains than you did when you were pl- You know, I mean, football, I'm sure you had your weeks where there were aches and pains, but, but those things went away. Now, these, these injuries, these things, you know, we're all at, at an age now where these pains linger a little longer and you're still able to compete, can you give us some advice yeah, on how, without the <laughs> performance-enhancing drugs, uh, how you stay in such great shape and are able to beat that? Basically what you do to, stay, to, to stay, in the, stay in the great shape, first of all, golf is much stretch. To me, that's, that's the key to longevity. Stretching those muscles, stretching those hamstrings, stretching that back, keeping yourself in good shape, watching what you eat, watching what you drink, those are the things you have to be very, very careful with. Because as a golfer, you have a, what you call a bad eating habit. You kind of eat on a run quite a bit. So if you just grab a piece of fruit, put a piece of fruit in the golf bag, that sort of stuff. When you get hungry, leave the sugars alone. Just eat a piece of natural fruit or something of that nature. Drink a lot of water on the golf course because you can become dehydrated. And it, it just just pay attention to your health, you know. Just don't jump out of the car and run to the first tee and start hitting. You need to stretch the hamstring, stretch the back out. You know, put a club between the arms and do some twisting and stretch those muscles out there to the point that it hurts a little bit. And you know what? Just basically watch what you eat, man. I, I tell you what, uh, very, very seldom I eat anything after 6, 30, or 7 o'clock at night. I might eat a snack or something or something, but I won't eat nothing heavy and, and lay down with it. Uh, that's the wonderful thing about this, this wonderful game that we play. But do you have a regular workout regimen that you do when you're not playing? Yeah, every day. Every day I do a little stretching, just a little bending. Nothing, nothing major. I don't, you know, I'm, like you said, I'll be six in February now. But I, I still do a little something, a little bending, a little stretching, that sort of stuff, even the days I don't play. And I tell you what, during the course of a year, there's only about eight, nine days I don't play. So you know what? Lucky man. I'm very, very lucky, man. But but at eight, even at age six and I feel that my game is as good as it has ever been. Uh, I've been blessed. I mean, a few few aches and pains. I had a few aches and pains this year where I didn't perform as well as I wanted to. But you know what? That's 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 all the, that's to me. That's all a part of the cycle that we live 
You know, uh, it's like I was telling somebody earlier today was talking, well, Jim, you're 39th on the money list. Can you get back to the Swab Championship? Of course I believe I can get back. You know what I mean? Uh, most people have had, had the back problem or the knee problem I had this year probably would have called it quits for the year. But, you know, I love the game. I enjoy being out here. I mean, this this is fantastic. You know, I could just pitch up camp camp here on Sonoma Golf Club and, and just, this. hey, yeah, this is where I live. You know, but even at age 60, you can still come out and compete and do these things and make more money than we ever dreamed of making. So th- th- that's the fantastic thing about it. And not just to make the money, but we give so much back. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have a chance to give back to to the Boys and Girls Club, have a chance to give back to the First Team Program, you have a chance to give back to the community, you have a chance to meet. Gary Player made one of the greatest statements that I've ever heard in life. He says, you know, I never judge my wealth by the money that I have made, you know, from endorsements and golf. He said, I judge my wealth about the friends, I, the people I have met. As I travel around this beautiful globe playing a game that I love, and i just like to add that I am more than a millionaire because I have met so many wonderful people. I play golf with so many people that would have came into my life unless it was golf, so I'm a very rich man. And you know what? That is, I totally agree to that. To be able to go and play the most beautiful venues in the world, meet some of the greatest people in the world, play golf with president, dine with kings and queens, man, we've been blessed. You can go on forever, but man, I think you just ended it right there. I think we ended it right there. That Perfect, Jim, man. Thank you best, so best much, of man. luck in the tour this year. Hey, it's going to be great, man. And you uh, know what? Listen, another I, victory in the championship, huh? Another victory. You know what? I'm one of those guys. If it happened. I've been blessed again. If it don't happen, I've been blessed anyway. So, you know, I got no complaints. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast. Thank you. Thank Golf you. Smarter TV. Yeah. Um, you know, I read that you, you were, uh, you would, if you had your druthers or if any other thing, you would have been a golf pro. You'd be teaching. Well, I was. That's when I started out. I, you know, they, I, uh, I got into golf and I worked in the bag room at the local country club to be able to have a place to practice and and uh, pick the range and did all that kind of stuff and i when i left college i ended up being the assistant pro out there and was doing my apprenticeship and that's what i was going to be i was going to be a club professional you know and, and teach and and run programs at the at, at a golf course and uh, I, I ended up uh, having a, a gentleman who was my coach for a long time by the name of jim swaggerty and he told me you need to try to play because if you end up teaching the game you're going to ultimately teach through your game so you need to develop as a player and just see uh, give yourself a shot you, you'll always kick yourself if you never try and so i went to the qualifying school and and i made it so um it took me three tries but i went and i made it and and so i ended up being a player instead of instead of a club professional but you never know i may i may retire and go back that direction when i get older because i just Do you like to teach i love being around golf i just love being around golf and so for um, it's an interesting that you said to learn how to play. And it seems like a lot of instructors today are teaching golf swings, how to make contact with the ball. But are they teaching how to play golf? Are these well, two different things? Yeah, it's all part of the same thing. I mean, you, you need to learn how to hit the ball correctly. All right. And there's, there's so many different ways to, to swing the golf club. You know, your body type determines kind of how you swing. I mean... Nobody else can really swing like Tiger Woods. I mean, you, you kind of have what's kind of your, what's in you, what's just part of your swing, but you can refine it and learn how to use that and get the most out of it. You can't take a young kid, give him the top flight instruction or the best instruction and give him the best set of clubs and turn him into a Tiger Woods. You don't know that that's going to happen. You know, not everybody can be a Tiger Woods. So you have to go out and get the most out of what you can do. And if it turns out to be a great player, then that's fine. But still enjoy the game. But there's so many different ways to go about learning how to play, and there's so many different parts about the game, you know, from chipping to short game to how to play the golf course to how to take advantage of what you do best and, and, and that sort of thing. And I think if you look at all the players that have had success maybe playing the game professionally or anybody, even good, good amateur players... 
they generally do one thing about their game better than something else. They usually will have something that they're really good at, whether they're good drivers, whether they're good putters, whether they're good, maybe they're really good with a seven iron or very good with a five. But even the average guy that goes out and has fun has one club in his bag that if he has to have a shot to beat his buddy out of five bucks, he'll go to that golf club. So you have to learn how to play to your strengths. And that's all about what teaching how to play the game is. Okay. And what about um, the mental aspect of the game? Now, here you are competing in your 50s, mm-hmm. and there's kids who are coming up on the tour now that may not have the mental aspect of the game, and they're not succeeding. Is that a big part of the game? Is the, you know, are you able to refine that more as an adult as a mature adult now? It's a huge part of the game. You don't know what your maturity development rate is going to be. You know, I look at my career, and I think I started playing the tour when I was 25, 26 years old. I didn't win for the first 13 years I played the tour. Now, I had some success. I went out there, and I was able to feed my family and make some money, and, and it was economically feasible for me to continue to play. But I didn't win for the first 12 and a half, 13 years. I started playing in 1981 was my first year. I finally won at Bay Hill in 1994. So uh, I look at myself and say, well, okay, maybe I'm a late bloomer. I've had a nice career on the Champions Tour, had a nice career later in my life on the regular tour, got some wins, but it took me 13 years to get there. So I wish you could impart the knowledge that I know now. I wish I'd have had that knowledge when I was 28, 29, 30 years old. It took me longer to get it. Now, some guys get it at a very early age. It depends on how what your maturation rate is for how, when you develop understanding how to control your emotions, how to play what works best for you, how to take advantage of your strengths. You never know when it's going to kick in. So do you think that's part of the crash and burn that's happening with a lot of these young phenoms that are coming up in the game? I think it is. That's a good tool. You have to crash and burn a few times to do it. And you know, you see young guys, and we're so starved for guys that will come out and win, and win repeatedly. And there's always that talk about there's not enough players that are in their 20s that are winning on the PGA Tour. We have a lot of foreign players, but there's not enough uh, young American players that are winning in their 20s. Well, you've got to crash and burn, and it's a cyclical thing. And I think you're going to see more younger players come up that are they're going to get through that at an earlier age and get and get winning again but it is you you got to get out there and go through the fire a few times um i received an email from one of our listeners and i think this is a really valid question that i'd love to get your opinion on and your advice if you have a limited amount of time to play which most golfers do right un- unlike professionals who that's their job if you have a limited amount of time to play and we're talking about limited amount of time we'll get to a limited amount of money in a minute mm-hmm. um lessons um Playing or practice, what should they be spending more of their time doing? Well, I think they should spend more of their time uh, practicing and then playing. But I think it should—I think you should spend about equal times of both. Lessons are not a huge thing. I think if if a golf professional is really a good golf professional and he works at a golf course, whether it's a municipal course or a public golf course or a private course should just be out there it doesn't take much to understand how to stand to the ball how to hold the ball once you show somebody that let them go out and have fun because you're involved in the game because you enjoy it and it's fun and it's not going to be fun standing out on the on the lesson tee three times a week an hour at a time trying to play the game you need to go out there and just get a club and a ball and start chipping it around a practice green somewhere just start chipping it around your backyard trying to Make the ball, you know, chip it over the bird bath into the gutter, stuff like that. You need to, that's what you need to do. That's the fun part about the game. And then you go out and play because it's no fun to just stand there and take lessons all the time and hit practice balls. That is part of learning the game, but ultimately you're doing it because you want to play the course. And that's what you need to do. You need to go out and you need to hit practice balls, have fun trying different kinds of shots, and then go out and play. And you don't have to play 18 holes. Go out and play nine holes later in the evening. Go out and play later. Or six and 12. I mean, what if courses right. were to, to change it to make, instead of nine holes, do three rounds of six? Because maybe you only have an hour and a half to play. Right. I, I think time constraints now, if you look at our society now from what it was 30 years ago, and I especially see it in the young kids coming up. I mean, they want to do something for an hour and move on to something else. Uh, if we could get golf down from four and a half to five hours to maybe a couple hours, two and a half hours, go play nine holes. Make it a nine-hole game and, and, but, and charge accordingly so that you're not 
spending eighty, ninety, a hundred dollars to play. We got to get back to where it's just it can't be just an open field, but let's have a golf course that's fifteen, twenty bucks to play. Got a couple of bunkers on it, a tee and a green, and there you go. You just go out and hit it. it doesn't have to be perfect. More power to you. Yeah. All right, so now we go with limited amount of funds. Mm-hmm. Now the question is, should they spend it on playing, uh, lessons, or equipment? They need to spend it on playing. You know, equipment is nice, but when you're first starting out or you're first getting into the game, you don't know what equipment's going to work best for you. So an old set of clubs with some steel shafts, you don't need graphite, you don't need this, you don't need that, Okay. You can get a very reasonable set of golf clubs at the swap meet. I'm telling you, you can go to the swap meet and just see what's out there. As long as it's, you know, a good steel shaft and it doesn't have to be forging or a cast. It can be anything like that. But just so that you can get a set of clubs and even go out. I'd love to see kids start with just a set of three, five, seven, nine wedge. You know, a three wood and a putter or a driver and a putter. I mean, Learn to play the game with half a set. You don't have to invest much money at all to get a set to get out there and play. And if you're younger and you're playing a half with a half a set, you'll learn to hit a lot of those in-between shots, and that helps you develop your feel. As a golfer, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Well, now you... Boy, I'm going to think about that. So, you know... That's uh, a, as a golfer, not a golf yeah, teacher, not yeah. a golf professional, but as a golfer... You know, my first coach, Jim Swaggerty, uh, told me, and obviously this is coming from a professional background, and then I'm looking at making it a career. He, he gave me a piece of advice. He said, you know, when you come back, you go out and you play the tour for a month, and you come back home and I watch you swing. I said, I want you to come back home and swing like Lauren Roberts. Don't come back home and be trying to swing like somebody else. And that was the best piece of advice I've got for my career is that hopefully my swing really hasn't changed that much over the years. I've just gotten better at repeating it. And uh, that's what I'm, that was the best piece of advice I got. Go out and kind of be yourself on the golf course and, and enjoy it. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Best of luck on the tour this year, and we really appreciate your time. And stay in shape, right? That's it's right. the hardest thing to do for our guys our age. Now. <laughs> you Actually, got, you, we're the same age. We're a couple weeks apart. you got to do it. And, and I heard a question earlier. You, you, when you get older and you start losing the game, why do you think maybe you, you don't get it play as well as you did down the crunch? Well, you know, if you're in good physical shape, <laughs> you don't get as tired, you're going to think better. <laughs> 